I'm here today with Fred Block, research professor of sociology at the University of California, Davis. We're here to discuss his book, The Power of Market Fundamentalism, Carl Polanyi's Critique, which was written with Margaret Summers of the University of Michigan. Thanks for joining us, Fred. Thanks for having me here. So, Polanyi's Critique and the Power of Market Fundamentalism. Let's start with the power, how, the power of market fun, fundamentalism. What is that power? What are you describing? Well, Polanyi, in his most important book, The Great Transformation, that was published in 1944, um, argued that what the free market, the people who are similar to our contemporary free market people who essentially say that the market can self-regulate and solve most problems and that the government can be kept to a minimum, he argued that those people were essentially advocating a utopia. He called it the free market utopia. And this was a kind of very significant move because up until 1944, that denouncing something as a utopia was basically the move that the right used against the left, against socialists, communists, social democrats. They would say, you have this vision of a better world in which people will be more equal and there'll be full democracy and so forth. That's all well and good, but it goes against human nature and it's impossible. Polanyi very self-consciously said that the vision behind the free market arguments was comparably utopian in this sense that what they were proposing was basically impossible. It couldn't, be, it couldn't be implemented. And so they were essentially selling to the public something which was um, a fantasy. And that what's powerful about his argument is the way he systematically makes that argument um, that their vision of a self-regulating market system with a minimum of government is in fact impossible. And the kind of key step in his argument by which he gets to that point is he says, look, there are three critical inputs to, to any economy. Um, and these uh, inputs have long been discussed in economic theory. There's land, there's labor, and there's money or, or capital. And he said that the vision of a self-regulating market requires the assumption that these three inputs, land, labor, and money, uh, would be self-regulating, that they could be organized entirely by the market. And he said that would be fine if they were commodities, by which he means things which were produced to be sold on the market, like widgets or iPhones or whatever. Those kinds of things you can regulate supply and demand through the price mechanism. But land, labor, and money are not produced for sale on the market. Land was um, given to us by the creator or happened to be here. It's nature. Um, labor is the activity of human beings. And the supply of money and credit is something which isn't produced spontaneously by, by markets. It's in our current system regulated and controlled by, by central banks. So what Polanyi was saying is that the neoclassical economists, all of those who make the argument about a self-regulating market system, have to pretend that these fictitious commodities behave like real commodities. But they can't because they weren't produced for sale on the market. And the reality, the historical reality, is that throughout the history of the market economy, the government has played a critical role in shaping both the supply and demand of these fictitious commodities. So in the case of land, um, there are agricultural policies that shape how much farmers produce. Um, more recently, we have zoning systems which determine what land can be used for what purposes. With labor, uh, governments have controlled the um, immigration, emigration, 
school systems to create certain kinds of educated labor. We have unemployment insurance, we have retirement systems and so forth. So that the, that, and then in the case of money, we've had for at least uh, for more than 100 years central banks that essentially try to avoid an excess supply of money which would involve inflation or a shortage of money which would imply deflation. So Polanyi is saying that just from the get-go of creating a market economy, the government is playing a central role in managing these fictitious commodities. And so the idea that you're going to push the government out and have a self-regulating market system is an impossibility, that it's the government itself, um, activity of, of states, that helps to constitute a market economy. And without that state role, there would be no market system. It's interesting because uh Inside of those debates, there were things like free banking movements where they wanted to make what you might call uh, endogenous money easier and not have it be controlled by the government. Right, and or to this day, there, there are people who I think argue that's what's for, going on. <laughs> or, or who would prefer that to our yeah. system of central banking, but yeah. the historical experience with that's free right. banking was not pretty. I mean, well, when you talk about the historical experience, Polanyi writes this book in 1944. This is on the back of two world wars and a Great Depression. It wouldn't seem he would have a hard time convincing people that the utopia hadn't been realized. That's right. That he, um, he had come to the same conclusion as uh, John Maynard Keynes, um, the, the people who helped to design the post-war monetary system at Bretton Woods. They all had the same understanding that uh, the free market system and particularly the institution of the international gold standard, which was kind of the, the centerpiece of a self-regulating market system, um, that those institutions had played a critical role in the crisis of the 1930s, had, mm -hmm. had led to the collapse of the global economy. So when Polanyi was making this argument, um, he was, um, kind of in accord with the general um, direction that, um, and we know that in the post-World War II period, um, that there was a kind of, uh, there was uh, a Keynesian moment that lasted for something like 30 years in which it was widely understood that governments had to play a central role in helping to economies move towards full employment. And we had a regulatory apparatus that um, regulated these fictitious commodities in a way that um, provided higher levels of, of social welfare and um, reduced, reduced inequality. But so, so there's um, the kind of ambiguity is that um, Polanyi was kind of both right and, and wrong because he thought that he had seen the end of the free market system. He thought that the ideas had been abandoned for good, although he also in the final chapter of his, of his book essentially made an argument that what was needed to get beyond the free market vision completely was a paradigm shift um, in which people redefined what freedom is. And essentially, he argued that, um, particularly in, in Anglo-American culture, um, there remained this idea of freedom which was highly individualistic, which was basically uh, parallel to freedom of conscience, just leave me alone and let me do my thing. And he argued that in a complex society, we're interdependent with other people, and that particular concept of freedom is archaic. I mean, that it's the Robinson Crusoe freedom doesn't make sense when we're in a complicated division of labor. Well, the freedom to do what you want is in conflict with the freedom from intrusion by others. Right, and that the freedom 
of some people to make a lot of money has a lot of consequences for the lack of freedom for other people who then have to work in Walmart at low wages or, or whatever. So he argued that uh, there was a need for this paradigm change in which we understood that living in a complex society, we had to elaborate a new conception of freedom, um, which was um, essentially the full development of the individual, that it's not a question of being left alone, it's a question of, of having the space to develop one's, one's capacities in connection with, with other people. And he believed that the way to achieve that freedom was through strengthening democracy and ultimately uh, subordinating the economy to, to democratic politics. Um, so in some sense, while he, was, while he was too optimistic that the free market idea had been killed off, his suggestion about this paradigm change um, gave him um, a claim to having been right because that paradigm change didn't happen um, there wasn't a new conception of freedom. There wasn't an understanding that in a complex society you had to have government. And the question was not minimizing government, but bringing government under the control of a democratic citizenry. And so... Um, the here's, here's someone like George Stigler with his theories of economic regulation would have said that the cure was worse than the disease unless you got... In other words, you forfeited the kind of individual freedom by putting government in control. But if that control didn't work in the idealized, romantic form of democracy, the cure could be worse than the, than the disease itself. Right. And so, I mean, the, um, Polanyi's book appeared the same year as, as Hayek's Road to Serfdom. Oh. And <laughs> in, in some sense, they were... Debating with sparring them. partners, yeah. And yeah. and Polanyi had known Hayek from from Vienna, had um, had known Hayek's teacher von Mises, and had been engaged in debates with von Mises back in the early 1920s. Um, so, but he but Polanyi is very explicit that this fear of government and planning that it will go terribly awry, that it will. Um, take us down the slippery slope to, to serfdom. Um, he argued that that fear was, was misguided, that if we understood um, the uh, potential of democratic politics, um, we could, in fact, um, create a deeper kind of freedom, a, a freedom in a complex society in which uh, people would be able to achieve their life plans. And um, he argued essentially for more abundant freedom. And again, he was... Abundant freedom, I mean that these constituents like health care, uh, education for you and your children, a secure retirement, uh, food... Exactly. ...are the so, big building blocks to allow one the freedom it, to develop themselves. And it's not merely a freedom of action vis-a-vis -vis an adversary called government. Exactly, and yeah. so Roosevelt's Four Freedom speech is the same year, and so mm -hmm. the same spirit that the freedom from hunger, the freedom from um, economic insecurity, this was part of what the meaning of freedom in a, in a complex society. So that that's exactly part of where Polanyi was going. But the other... Um, the other piece of the story was that Polanyi was deeply critical of the of the Soviet Union, of the of the mm -hmm. Soviet experience, mm -hmm. and um, he's very explicit in those final pages of the of the book that in his conception of of freedom, um, there needs to be freedom for nonconformity. That that people who have different different views, who who reject the prevailing um, understandings of how society should work. Um, he, in his vision of freedom, there would be um, greater protections for those people against kind of um, 
economic yeah. or political marginalization. And so then you had someone like Frank Knight at the University of Chicago who uh, in many respects thought that democracy could not be achieved, that the requirements of the body politic in terms of learning and attention was a, was a utopian vision unto itself. And I think that kind of duality between the free market as a utopia and democracy as a utopia set the stage for the next, what you might call, window of grinding conflict that uh, culminated in Ronald Reagan. How did we go from a place where people experienced two world wars and a depression and a New Deal and a four freedom speech and Polanyi and we end up back with Hayek and Milton Friedman in 1980? Well, so the first part is that that paradigm change that Polanyi called for didn't happen. And so the conception of freedom remained the same, the freedom to be left alone. I mean, don't tread on oh. me. And so the, um, the organized right in the 60s and 70s very self-consciously pushed on that concept of freedom on saying that um, government has gotten too big, it's, it's heading down the road to serfdom, and it's only by pushing back against government, expanding the scope of the market, uh, that people will have I, both freedom and, and economic prosperity because, yes. of course, they blamed all of the economic problems that began to materialize in the late 60s and early 70s. They blamed those all on too much government. Um, they so, also blamed them on the, what they might call the audacity of paternalism. I know Robert Nelson wrote a book called Economics as Religion where he characterized Knight's view of fallibility, almost a Karl Popper-like perspective with Paul Samuelson, who was portrayed, or caricatured, you might say, as a control engineer from the top down, turning the dials in macroeconomics, stabilizing things for the people. The OPEC price shocks and the stress on profitability and so forth at the end of the uh, 60s and into the early mid-70s uh, created things like inflation rising when unemployment was rising. So the superficial view, the Phillips curve, is obliterated and this fueled the Friedman and eventually Robert Lucas and, and others in taking apart that paternalistic view. Right, and so part of that is the decline from Keynes's vision in the, in the 30s and 40s um, to the kind of technocratic Keynesianism of the Council of Economic Advisors under Kennedy who said we could fine tune the economy and uh, economics is a highly developed science and we have all of the, these levers and we can fly the economy like a 777. <laughs> um, that all of those, that technocratic emptying out of the content of Keynesianism made it brittle, made it very easy for the right to attack it mm -hmm. on those kind of Knightian grounds. I mean, that mm -hmm. basically nobody likes technocratic arguments. They're, they're unpopular because they essentially leave the public out of the, the process. And so that was part of what um, made it possible for these free market ideas to, to return. So in that sense, um, in the book, we contrast Polanyi with, with Keynes. I mean, that on some points, they, they clearly converged. But um, Keynes, um, Keynes, at the end of the day, was an elitist, and he wanted economic policy in the hands of, of experts. Mm -hmm. And um, Polanyi was more deeply a Democrat. His vision had been uh, shaped by the experience of Vienna in the interwar years, that in, in, the, um, in the 20s and, and the beginning of the 30s, um, Vienna was the kind of crowning achievement of the, of the European working class. They had essentially a system of municipal socialism in which they, um, the socialists had power within the city. Um, they um, 
created a very strong education system, they built housing, um, they raised the living conditions of the Viennese working class. And this worked economically because essentially this, um, this better off working class um, had higher levels of skill, they were more productive workers, and so Vienna as a city flourished in this, in this period. So Polanyi took from this experience um, the understanding that um, one could protect people from the market, one could develop social welfare institutions and have a well-functioning economy, and all of this could work if the people really had a voice in government, if they were able to be politically empowered. Mm -hmm. So his, his belief in the potential of democracy to create a well-functioning economy was rooted in that historical experience. Mm -hmm. And that we know from the experience of European social democracy, particularly in those three decades right after World War II, that that worked. I mean, that Sweden and the other Scandinavian countries achieved some of the highest standards of living with very dynamic economies um, and um, a high level of political participation. So the, the belief that democracy um, is the foundation for uh, an effective state managing a market economy uh, protecting people from the, the logic of the market. There is historical experience to, to support that. But I, I, I want to say there's some historical experience to support it, and there are some reason to be very skeptical. It, I mean, I, I can see people watching this video might be saying, Keynes was an elitist. We talked about the Samuelson model of con control engineering like you're flying an airplane. A lot of people will say, but that's not how policy gets done. Robert Collins' book, The Business Response to Keynes, about how the business community mobilized and pushed leadership into choosing to cut taxes on business, repeatedly ratcheting them down in the name of Keynesian stabilization. Or the idea that, uh, how would I say, democracy is going to produce a healthy and uh, what you might call vital and intelligent system is undermined a little bit by Mansur Olson's logic of collective action where concentrated interests have the power relative to diffuse interests, however intelligent. Are we, are we overvaluing the quality of mind and understanding relative to what you might call might makes right? Uh, and in which case both Poliani and uh, Keynes are a bit on the defensive and what we see now is the, what you might call rather ugly byproduct, where people don't trust at this juncture government to regulate finance. Well, I mean, I think that the, the way that I see the problem is that um, we have um, now 30, 40 years of, of this constant claim that the way in which a market economy, a capitalist economy, whatever we want to call it, um, works best is with the limited amount of, of governmental activity and that, that the needs of the economy trump the, the logic of democracy. So if the people uh, vote themselves higher pensions and more generous social security, they need to be overruled because those things are inconsistent with a, a market economy. And I think um, too many people have, even people of progressive inclination, have internalized that critique. They've come to believe that, um, that the oligarchs are right and that ultimately the only way in which capitalism can work is if all power goes to the corporation. perfect example of that is the pension crisis that we have. The idea that somebody's worked 45 years under a contract where they took lower wages and bigger benefits, but now we can't afford it. So we're entitled to default on them because the oligarchs or elites, as you call it, say we can't pay. Right, and of course all the derivative contracts that those cities have entered into are <laughs> sacred and they cannot be touched. Right. Um, but so, um, 
So I, I think that, um, that I, I want to emphasize a kind of um, distinction that I don't think is sufficiently made in our kind of political economic analysis, which is that um, there are two ideal type ways of, of making profit. And the first is through predation. I mean, that you make money by taking it away from somebody or by imposing terrible costs on somebody, you know, working them so hard they lose their health. Yeah, or, some called finance the repackaging industry. Right. Yeah. Or, right, through high frequency trading, you mm -hmm. make your money by getting in three seconds before other people, and as yeah. Michael Lewis has told us. Um, the second ideal type of, of how to make profit is by delivering more efficiency without externalities, without imposing costs. So the engineers who've kept um, making the chips, uh, the computer chips, smaller and smaller and doubling their capacity every year and a half or, or two years um, have made possible the production of this whole series of of products where the costs go down and the capacity rises. That's the, the paradigm of, of producing more efficiently. And so I want to argue that we've got predation over here and we've got greater efficiency over here. Um, that the more democratic a polity, and I'm not just talking about having periodic elections like Putin does, but of having really meaningful institutions of, of democratic politics, of free and open debate, high levels of participation, um, competitive parties, a free speech, a free press, the whole ball of wax, that the more effective democracy you have, the more it tilts the economy away from predation and towards finding more efficient ways to produce things. And so we're now in a vicious downward cycle where we're getting ever less democracy and ever more predation. And then the predators, the oligarchs, um, use their great wealth to further influence the political process through campaign funding and ads and, and so forth um, to essentially clear the way for even more predation. But that the basic reality is that no no country ever got richer by predation. It's a zero-sum activity. It takes wealth from some people and transfers it to others. It's only the efficiency route that makes people better off. Or, or going to war with somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> so that, um, and so why is democracy so important to tilting the balance away from predation towards efficiency. Well, first of all, um, when people have a voice, um, they're able to say, no, you know, this activity that you're doing, this high frequency trading, um, this isn't creating any value. This is just taking money away from us, you know, meaning that when we trade through our mutual funds or our pension funds, we're giving you a few dollars on every transaction. That doesn't make, make any sense. So democratic pro politics gives you the regulatory, or can give you, and obviously it requires contestation and it doesn't happen automatically, but it creates the potential for the regulation that can bring um, the predation un under control. Um, so it, it's kind of, um, we saw this um, in Russia kind of right after the, the fall of communism, the, the people who believed in a quick transition came in and said, we're gonna bring in the market overnight, we're gonna privatize everything. Shock treatment. At, yeah. Shock treat therapy. And what happened, the predation took off. Mm -hmm. I mean, that because the fastest way to make money every time is stealing it from other people. So mm -hmm. kidnapping became a big business in, in in Russia. Or the privatizations of public resources. Right, uh, that, that the those oligarchs. Those with power could become right. wealthy in a windfall. Right, and that lots of the um, Russian capacity, industrial capacity, was simply smuggled across the border and sold in, in, in other countries. Um, 
So that, that, that's the point that it's always easier to make money through predation. The efficiency route, um, getting those um, more circuits on a chip, that's hard. It takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of capital, it takes a lot of skill in pushing the technological envelope. And uh, so it's only in those societies where the predation route is effectively closed down that you get mm -hmm. business people to focus on making money through greater efficiency. I argued this, I grew up in Detroit. I argued that we harmed, in the long run, the American auto companies by allowing government intervention to uh, be a substitute for R&D. That by relaxing fuel standards and other things and knowing they could manipulate Washington, they weakened themselves in the long run relative to competitors like Toyota and others. Uh, absolutely. absolutely. And your yeah. previous book, I know, uh, that we've talked about on camera together, uh, The State of Innovation, talks about the role of the state in a constructive support of the process of that healthy innovation. The problem I have now, or that I think we all have now, is the state of trust after the bailouts and bonuses of TARP, which unmasked a tremendous amount of failing in the democratic process, albeit the officials probably had to stop us from going over the waterfall, but there were no penalties attached to the polluters. Absolutely. How do we get back to that state of trust? How do we get back to that place where people trust the government to be, play a role in innovation, like Mariana Mazzucato and others are writing about. How do we get to the place where those democratic things that Polanyi thought were the essential ingredients to a constructive society are back in place? What, what's the trajectory that you envision? Well, that's the $64,000 question, and um, I didn't go on that show, but um, <laughs> that, um, I mean, I, I think that, um, that one of the one of the ways that I I, I think it will happen um, is is from the bottom up, and so we are seeing um, experiments going on at um, municipal levels, at the city level. You know, in in some states, I mean, they're um, carrying out healthcare reform in in different ways. So I, I mean, I think that. Um, that I think that progressives in the in the U.S. Um, have been too single-mindedly focused on on Washington and the and the federal government. And they kind of lost those uh, battles, I think. Well, or I mean, right, and or we've learned the we should have learned the lesson from the Obama administration that that having the White House isn't isn't sufficient. Um, you know, as we've seen in the healthcare, the, the battles being fought out. On the, at the state by state level, and our capacity at the many of those in many of those states is is too too weak. So I think that um, that reinvigorating democracy um, is something that has to begin happening um, at the at the local level at the, at the state level. Um, I've written recently about a kind of um, um, vision for democratizing finance because I, I believe very strongly that, um, that we're never going to be able to get the regulatory regime right for Bank of America and, and Citibank. I mean, that they remain too big to, to, to fail, fail, too <laughs> big to jail. Um, and so that what, what we need is to rebuild a financial system from the bottom up. I mean, so um, that, uh, I mean, the interesting thing is that we actually have um, a quite elaborate network of credit unions across the country. Um, I think they have something like um, um, 10 to 12 percent of the, of the bank deposits um, that I think a very systematic effort to essentially um, revitalize, rebuild, and expand those credit unions mm -hmm. um, would be a way to essentially um, begin a process by which uh, communities um, begin to put 
financial control back in their own hands, that they use their own savings um, to invest in things in, in their communities. Um, there are initiatives at this point for... Public pensions. Public pension control and management, where the pay-to-play schemes, governors and municipal officials and pension fiduciaries are all getting uh, PACs together, super PACs, campaign contributions from the people who want to manage the money and will earn fees. Uh, right, and they send that money off to Wall Street and it gets, lots of, lots of it gets skimmed off by the... By the fee by, structure. Right. Which comes back in the form of campaign contributions. So. Right, but the, the, the alternative to that would be for at least some portion of that pension fund money going back yeah. into those communities. To, but I see things on both sides of this coin. I think you're right that the bottom-up locality where things are close to the ground makes sense and you do see some positive signs of, of more democratization. On the other hand, in Michigan, where I come from, I've been listening and watching Grace Lee Boggs and Shia Howell and the Michigan Citizen and others writing about this democratization. And then the governor imposes an emergency manager, Kevin Orr, and he's restructuring the pension funds and not touching the tax code. Uh, the, it, the, how would I say? There's some top-down authoritarian responses at the same time as dem democratic responses to this widespread dysfunction. Right. No, and I, I mean, I think one of the most powerful things in, in Polanyi is that he suggests very strongly that this contestation and this, this effort um, to bring the economy under democratic control has to proceed at all three levels, at the, at the local level, at the national level, and at the global level. Mm -hmm. I mean that um, you, you can only get so far at the local level and then you start running into national level or state level obstacles. Um, well, you also run into the notion that whether you're a locality, a state, or a nation, capital has wings. Absolutely. Technological knowledge has wings, so there's an arbitrage Absolutely. To the lowest common denominator. Absolutely, which is why um, reform at the global level, um, moving back to the, the ideas of Bretton Woods or even to the vision of an international clearing union that Keynes mm -hmm. had in, in the 40s, um, all of those, in other words, that, um, that even those countries at this point that have quite progressive leaders um, are constrained by this um, international capital mobility and the irrationality of the of the international monetary rules that we're living under so um, so it's a a process of contestation where that has to begin initially by the building up of capacity at the local level that quickly has to um, divert some of its energies to fighting for reforms at the national or in the European case at the supranational level. And simultaneously, there needs to be this greater contestation at the, at the global level of putting on the agenda the kind of, of structural reforms that are needed. So nobody said it was going to be easy. I mean, That's right. But I will say, when you write a book like this, which, which you might call elevates Polanyi's critique and vision, casts it in relation to market fundamentalism, it does make it easier for all of us. And in that respect, I thank you for, uh, how do I say, fomenting the critical discourse and, uh, and bringing uh, Polanyi back into focus for the challenges that we face now. Thank you very much. Thanks for being with us.